Hello there. Um, and welcome to the webinar on submitting your best program proposal for the Akuho I conference. Um, we want to let you know first that we're going to have all of uh, the participant microphones on mute as we're presenting today. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, submit them via the Q&A uh, button that you should see there on your screen. And we will uh, answer them if we can as we go or as we approach the end of the presentation. So to start off with just some introductions, my name is Melissa McDonald. Um, I am an assistant director of residence of life at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I am also serving on the Akuhuai program committee uh, in a role as the uh, program administrator for this year as part of our uh, leadership team. And my name is Lori Sabata and I'll be presenting with Melissa today. We're both co-presenting, and I am actually on the um, Akuhuai professional staff team, and I have been the, well, I guess liaison, we don't call it that anymore, it's professional staff um, leader to the um, Akuhuai Conference and Expo program committee. So I've done that for about 10 years. I think this actually might be my 11th conference. So, and, and Melissa and I have been working together for um, a number of years now, so we're both really excited to be um, getting ready to, you know, get our programs together for 2020 in Portland and to share some, some information with you today that we um, know will be helpful to you as you're submitting your, uh, your programs and, and getting ready for that. So, um, next we wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, uh, briefly some conference milestones and dates. Uh, as you're likely already aware, you've received some of the Akuhawai email communication. The call for programs is actually open now. Um, and the proposals are being accepted anytime between now and the deadline of Tuesday, December 3rd this year. Um, and to be able to present, you do need to be planning to attend the conference. And the conference this year is in Portland, Oregon from June 27th through 30th. Uh, and the conference registration will open up in January. Uh, and then presenters will be notified of their program status in, in February. And we'll get a little bit more into the program proposal uh, process and deadlines and such as we go on. Um, just to provide a brief overview of what we're going to cover today, we're going to share some information that helps you understand uh, who attends the KUHOI conference based on who attended the conference last year in Toronto, um, and as well as information about things you may want to consider as you prepare uh, to submit a proposal for the conference. We're also going to preview the proposal submission process, and we're going to share some information about uh, what is considered as our program review committee uh, reviews the programs. All right, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about, um, as Melissa mentioned, um, some data that we collected from our um, conference and exposition last year in Toronto. If you were fortunate enough to attend in 2019, we had, a, um, we had an excellent conference there. Um, and so we, we also, we collect, um, we do a, a post-conference survey and so we collect all kinds of information. Um, but what we wanted to share with you today was um, just a few slides won't get into a lot of nitty gritty detail of just trying to give you an idea as you're you know thinking about ideas for submitting um, programs um, who your audience is I think one of the important things is to always think about um, who's going to be in the room where you're going to be presenting um, so we wanted to share some of that information with you today so um, here's a breakdown of actual roles um, of those that were um, attending the conference last year. Um, so I'm not going to read through uh, all of the information on the slide. Um, and I did want to mention too that um, we are recording this webinar. So if we go through, you know, one of these kinds of slides and has data on it a little bit too quickly for you, we'll be sharing the recording of this webinar. So you can always go back and, you know, take a look and say, oh, what was that? What was the percentage of you know, corporate partners, you can go back and, and take a look at that. But I guess one thing to kind of point out um, on the slide, which really isn't a surprise, is that, you know, overwhelmingly, it uh, looks like the largest category of um, what we would call roles, I guess, um, is residence life. So I think it's no surprise that this is largely, I guess we would call it a res life um, conference. And the other categories are made up of business operations, facilities management, what we call other corporate partners and exhibitors, and then more than one of these broad categories. And Melissa, if I miss anything that's key here, just feel free to jump in and interrupt me. I won't mind. Uh, 
Um, we also have it broken down by functional area. So um, again, I'm not going to read all the information on the slide, but you can definitely look at the bars on the graph and see what sort of stands out at you. So um, obviously of, of those that filled out the survey, um, you know, senior housing officer level, we have a large um, group. And then next after that would be coordinator of resident hall director level, assistant director level, and then on down from there. Okay, well, that was that was really short. Um, we're going to move on to content and audiences. So, um, we wanted to share some information about the Kuhawai core curriculum. Uh, so, Kuhawai is uh, consistently engaged in, in the development of its core curriculum, and this is based upon um, a body of knowledge, which basically the body of knowledge identifies what camp campus housing professionals need to know to be able to do their jobs. Um, and this body of knowledge includes 12 different core competency areas, and those are areas that are really unique to our uh, work in housing residential life, as well as uh, several core content areas that are not unique to housing but are equally as important to our work. Um, and all of these things make up the curriculum. So to go on to the next slide, what you have here is this slide lists the 12 core competency areas. It has several different subdomains um, and then also some core content, all of the core content areas that relate to the work being done in, uh, by individuals in the organization. Um, and so as you're considering submitting your conference proposal, it's really important to recognize these areas and consider how the content you're proposing fits into the Yaku Hawaii core curriculum. Uh, the program proposal form is going to ask you what is your primary and your secondary core competency areas, uh, which of those areas you believe your proposal fits under. Um, and then that information is going to be used by the program committee as we work to ensure that we're offering a robust and a diverse slate of programs for conference attendees. Uh, Lori did mention that you know, we do have a large number of attendees from the residential life area. However, we also do have attendees in a variety of other different um, areas across housing and so we do want to make sure that you know we make the conference well worth everyone's time in terms of offering programs across uh, a wide variety of these areas. Very good. Um, Melissa did we mention you may have said this but do we mention this year we're going to allow people to select a second core competency area? Yeah so I did mention that there'll be okay. the primary area and then the secondary. The secondary is optional you don't have to enter that uh, but you, you can select one because we have had situations before where we read the proposals and thought wow this really does fit into more than one. In the past we only had the one option but now you can do a secondary if you'd like. Thanks. Um, in addition uh, to providing experiences at the conference that focus on the content of you know, what we do every day in our positions. Uh, the program committee works to provide learning opportunities that are useful to individuals at different stages of their careers uh, during the conference. So the program proposal form is going to ask you uh, who is the primary target audience for your program. So if you look at this slide, it gives you sort of a breakdown of the different um, primary target audience uh, options that are available. It's really important for you to consider who your intended target audience is and make sure that your presentation content is aligned with that audience. Um, one of the biggest concerns we do receive at the conference each year is that there are attendees that attend a program and you know perhaps it says it's meant for uh, a new professional or it's and it's actually the content is more applicable to sort of a mid-level season or a senior leadership or, or vice versa. And so we really do ask uh, presenters to really consider who is your intended audience, audience, target audience, and make sure that your content aligns with individuals at that level in their career. Um, it's also important to consider uh, what stage of uh, your career yourself and any of your fellow presenters might uh, be in as you prepare your proposal. And now we're going to move on to the submission and review process. Right, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the actual uh, mechanics of submitting the program. If you've not done this before, um, at least in any in any regard, you know, a KUI or maybe some other um, conferences, um, it is an all online process. And I, I'm not sure I may have failed to mention earlier that it actually is open now. It opened on October 8th. Um, and I'm just going to walk through kind of, um, if you haven't seen it already, like where you go to find that, how you submit it, and some information there. So. Um, but before I before I get into that sort of demo part of it, I'd wanted to just kind of go over um, some of the the um, different components of um, you know the sort of the review process and how programs are selected and sort of this is, this is sort of the you know a little bit of the how to how the sauce is, is made behind the scenes that um, that I'm going to share a little bit to kind of help you um, 
frame your proposal and think about how to build it. Um, so we do have a scor scoring criteria um, that is applied by reviewers as they're going through, um, you know, once all the programs, you know, when the, the call ends on December 3rd, we have a really um, two part robust um, review process that or two cycle, I guess, two rounds of reviews that the programs go through. Um, and they're scored um, using this criteria on a scale of one to five. So I'm not going to read through um, every little bit of it. Again, um, you'll be able to have this information later um, to look at. And it's also listed on our website as well, which I'm going to show you in a little bit too. So you'll be able to go there to find um, this information and refer to it. But I just wanted to point out that we do have a, uh, some specific criteria that we apply to it. So, so it's not all just, you know, arbitrary. Um, so this is a um, this is just a, an example of um, a proposal that was submitted that scored very highly. Um, I think this has been a couple years now. But um, so this is an example of a title and a description. And I just wanted to kind of show it to you so that you could kind of read through um, what um, kinds of proposals um, score well and sort of look at the detail um, that's included in it. And notice that the title basically says what it is. It's not extremely long, although you only have about 70 characters, including spaces, um, but doesn't, doesn't include a lot of, you know, colons and quotes and a lot of, um, you know, characters and things like that. Um, and then the, the session is fairly um, compelling and descriptive as well. So that's something that we look for. Um, we're going to ask for learning objectives. They, there's three learning objectives and all of these fields are um, mandatory fields, so you have to fill out all of them to be able to submit the form. Um, they don't have to be, you know, perfect three-point or five-point learning objectives. They just need to kind of support, actually, you know, the, the description that you have in all of all of the activities in your program, especially when we get to your outline that we'll talk about in a little bit, should support these three learning objectives. I know that this is really hard to read and I don't expect anyone to be able to read it or have time to read it, but the, the purpose of showing this slide is, is I want to talk a little bit about the outline because, um, you know, after 10 years or so of reading program proposals, um, it always seems to kind of come down to the outline being one of the most important components for a couple of reasons. I think one of them is that, I mean, it really helps the, the reviewers understand how your pro, how are you going to achieve, you know, they've read your title, your description, they've looked at your learning objectives. Now this helps them visualize how you're actually going to achieve that. How are you going to physically do it? And I think one of the things they also want to see is, you know, 50 minutes, which is our, our longest program type at this point, is not a lot of time. And they're trying to figure out, you know, by the time everyone gets into the room, and get settled down and you know the moderator gets everyone settled down and you, and you close the door you know you've got some 45 minutes left how are you going to achieve all of these outcomes in that time frame and still have time for you know possibly some peer interaction some interactivity and then questions and answers at the end and then time to collect evaluations and and how are you going to get it all done um, i think another reason why the outline is so important is that i think sometimes we get a lot of programs that are very similar in topic um, and the outline really helps when someone is saying, you know, saying, well, I have five programs that are just so similar. They're all good programs. How do I decide, you know, which, how does one stand out from another? And I think the outline is really something um, that helps with that. And one thing I probably can't see it, but I, I wanted to show it because I wanted to show the level of detail basically that we're looking for in a really good outline. And this one really kind of spells it out. It gives an introduction. It, kind of restates the learning objectives and then it goes through and says, okay, I'm going to spend five minutes doing this. I'm going to spend 10 minutes doing that and really, really kind of breaks it down. So, so I wanted to show that and I apologize that it's difficult to read, um, but I just wanted to show it as an example and that also, you know, if you want to look at the recording, you can go back and see this as well. Lori, I would just um, add in there that through the outline and through the learning objectives, um, that can be uh, one of the ways too that we uh, as program reviewers can really have to start to understand how is the program you proposed, uh, how is it a fit for the target audience that you've suggested, or you know certainly for those, those core competency areas. So it's helpful to see some alignment between what's described in the outline and the activities or the discussion or the uh, information you're gonna present. Uh, or what's described in the learning outcomes about what participants will learn 
and alignment with you know where a participant might be in their career and what you suggested as your target audience as well as um, what you've stated as your core competency areas uh, because if those things don't line up it's really difficult for us to you know understand uh, that that's the best information we can get to sort of help us understand how those things fit from the program from the outline and the objectives yep that's absolutely true and Melissa you've reviewed your fair share of programs so you know what you're talking about there. <laughs> um, so I wanted to provide just, uh, you know, we reviewed some components of this sample program. So I just wanted to provide some information um, as to the rationale as to why this program scored very highly and was, was um, chosen. So the topic um, is relevant and unique. Um, and it's, you know, if you read the description of, of what the reviewer had said about it, it's like, wow, this is something we really need. Um, the title is descriptive, as I mentioned before, of what it's going to be about. It's nice when you're able to have a descriptive title that's also catchy, but that's really difficult to do. Um, it's not campus specific, so I know that, um, you know, we like to see things that are um, topics that can be applied to all campuses. So not necessarily even if it's something that just because you did something on your campus, you know, and you want to have a program about it doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. It just means that you need to show how that's going to apply generally and can be applied to other situations and other um, um, settings. As we mentioned before, the outline is very detailed, gives a good idea of what's going to really happen in the session, supports the learning objectives, and they were also very um, detailed about how that they were going to break down their time. Um, and in general, it meets all of the defined criteria. Overall, it's overall is very well thought out and thorough. So that's what we're looking for. Now I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the actual nitty gritty of the online um, submittal process. And so I'm gonna um, pull another screen over here, but I might have to stop sharing this. I have to close down my slideshow just for a minute and I'm gonna drag over the website. Can you, Melissa, can you see the Akuhai website? Is that yeah. showing now? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to show you if you haven't, I know that we've sent out a number of um, emails and connections and I think last week we sent out another email um, to our membership that was you know specific to the call for program saying hey it's open you can submit and that included a link in it but if you didn't get one of those emails or it was in your email box and you can't find it and you're like oh I want to go submit where do I find that link I just wanted to walk you through how to do that so um, what um, the best way to do that then is to start at the the main Akuhai webpage and if you click on educational events and you go to Akuhai conference and expo um, if you go down the side you'll find um, well you'll find some general information about the conference itself which is good because it includes some dates and it um, pretty soon we should have some information about the hotel block and that opening up um, and Melissa mentioned earlier that registration is going to open up sometime in January. We don't know the specific date yet, but this sort of landing page here is a good place to look for all of that. There's other information um, on this page, exhibits and sponsors. We have our future conference dates and we talk about, um, we have um, some of our speakers contracted already, which I know we've communicated about. Um, and then there's this tab here that's um, specific to call for programs. And so I wanted to draw this to your attention because we really have a lot of a lot of the information that Melissa and I are talking about on this webinar is also on this web page. So it's a really good place to go um, to refer to that. Um, what I would suggest is I would read all of this first. Even if you have submitted programs before in the past, we do change things. Um, and we'll talk about this um, in a couple of minutes, but we do have some newer um, sort of pilot programs that we're asking people if they're interested in participating in this year. So I think it's a really good idea to read through all of this information. You can see this little column in here talks about those and there's some um, sort of click buttons here where you can drop the column down and you can read more detailed um, information in it. But basically you can see we're talking about audience types of sessions, core competencies that Melissa talked about. There's the pilot programs um, here. Um, down here some really good information, some tips, tips and tricks, and we'll talk about this too. Um, how to get your program selected, um, how to actually submit, um, what happens, talks a little bit more about, you know, I went over the scoring criteria, but this talks a little bit more about um, the evaluation and selection process. Um, and this is that criteria I told you about that's also listed here. 
Um, so this helps you a little bit um, how after you submit your program, how there's a presenter service center located at this link. It's also at the top of the page as well that you can go to and you can check the status of it. Um, some details about technology on site, which come into play a little bit later. Um, on the bottom of the page are some just general guidelines of sort of topic areas. They're not necessarily specific topics um, that you might want to consider, but not necessarily limited to these topics. These are just ideas if you're just, you know, sitting there and thinking, I have no idea what to submit. You know, I need something to kind of, you know, get me thinking and get me started. Um, it's good to read through these. Um, we also have included a, um, a button up here. So this is the submission button. This is also the, um, it's an assistance guide. So what this is meant to be is it's a PDF. And I would recommend downloading that PDF because I think really the best way, it's an online submission process and it's always subject to if your internet goes out or something happens and you're just typing information into the form and for some reason it doesn't save there's always the chance that you can lose all your information. It doesn't typically happen, but it does happen. So what I would really recommend as a good best practice for submitting a proposal online is to download this assistance guide because it'll tell you ahead of time all the information that you need to gather. So I would read through it. I would think everything through, perhaps even create a Word document, um, answer all of the questions ahead of time. And then by the time you are getting to the point where you wanna submit your proposal and you're clicking this button, that you are pretty much cutting and pasting into this form and then saving it. What I would recommend. Um, and it's going to pull up now. And so this is just your typical online, you know, you know, so as opposed to typing into these fields, I would recommend cutting and pasting into the field. Um, I do want to point out that this, um, when you get to the field with the presenters, it's a, it's a lookup field. It's best to try to look up the names rather than type them into these boxes. These boxes are meant to be if, these are for presenter names. So it's if you, your presenter isn't in the database, you can type them in, but it's always better to try to find them using the lookup tool because that connects them to their member record and has all of their correct information. Um, so, um, and also we have, you can list up to three presenters here. If you have a panel, you can have more, but there isn't space for more than three presenters. So you would have to include the um, extra presenters names in the outline field. These are the learning objectives that we talked about earlier. Um, this is a link to that assistance guide uh, page that I just showed you a few minutes ago. You select your session type. Um, this is where you would um, create your outline. Um, the primary target audience that um, Melissa talked about. Um, we're asking you to um, indicate the number of professional years of experience you have in the field. Um, you select your primary core competency and a secondary one if you have one. Um, we're asking you if you feel the program can be directly applied to organizations outside of the US. Um, and then these two questions here talk, describe the pilot programs um, that we, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, and if you're interested in them. This only means that, yes, I think that my topic might be applicable to this. I'd like to try participating in this pilot. I'm gonna go ahead and click yes. If you think not, then you click no. They're, they're not, um, they're, they're self, you know, they're not mandatory fields. Um, and then you would either save your um, save it as a draft, or you would hit next, and then it gives you a summary of the information, and then you can you can submit the program. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned earlier, here's a link to the presenter service center, which you could then go to, and it will give you a kind of a countdown and a status of when we would be announcing when programs are accepted. Um, and then also, I know sometimes um, drafts are difficult to find. Um, sometimes after you, you save a draft, it's hard to figure out where they are on the website. So I included a button for that as well. It should take you directly to where your drafts are. You can pull those up, edit them, and then finish it and then submit it. So I'm just going to check real quick to see if there's any questions about any of that process because I know um, this, that tends to be sort of intense and detailed. Um, Someone had asked when and where the recording of the presentation will be posted. So I'm going to put it on YouTube and we'll probably send, uh, I'll probably put the link right on this page actually. Um, and we'll also send it out to, I can send the link out to everyone who attended the webinar as well. Um, someone also asked a question about the um, early bird registration, if it's still going to be open at the time the proposal submitters are notified whether or not their program was accepted. Yes. 
early bird will still be open at that time. And we usually announce um, program statuses early in February. Um, so, okay. Um, I'm going to then, we're going to talk about some program types. Um, so I'm going to switch back over to the PowerPoint, hopefully. There we go. So um, in terms of program types, um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of these uh, here. Uh, there are also, in addition to uh, the few I'm going to highlight, we do have uh, standard uh, interest sessions, which are 50 minutes sort of typical conference sessions uh, around general topics that uh, similar to ones you may have attended in the past at Google I or at other conferences. Um, and there are also, uh, we do have panels. Those are in the, the drop down list that Lori just showed you on the proposal. And those are 50 minute sessions that involve obviously panelists uh, speaking about a particular topic. Um, quick takes, uh, we have, uh, they're fast paced, they're 30 minute sessions, and they're really time for you um, as a presenter uh, to share information around a narrowly defined topics. So if you are interested in, say, presenting information about a research project and some outcomes that you gathered from that, or if you're interested in sharing um, information about the impact of an educational program uh, or uh, a major change that you made on your campus or in your housing residential life organization, among other things, um, this might be the program type you want to consider. Uh, next up is roundtables, and in terms of roundtables, uh, those are 50-minute sessions. Um, they're really uh, spaces that are set up to be conducive to having a facilitated discussion, and because of this, we do limit them to 25 participants. Uh, there isn't any AV provided or technology for these sessions. We do give you a flip chart and some markers, but the focus of the, se the roundtable session is meant to be discussion, and that's why the chairs are sort of set up in that way to help uh, you do that as a presenter. Um, many of our presenters will use this time and space to maybe share and discuss uh, best practices or ideas around a particular topic. Uh, next up, and Lori's mentioned this a couple times throughout, that we do have um, two new questions we just showed you on this year's proposal that relate to two new program types that we're going to be piloting uh, at the 2020 conference in Portland. Uh, if you are interested in participating in either of these, uh, please do indicate that when you complete uh, the proposal form. Um, the first is really based upon our membership sharing uh, the many benefits of being able to participate participate in a program to help them learn. So the first uh, new type is going to be specifically focused on active learning with um, a focus on audience participation. Uh, individuals who are or, uh, selected for this pilot program um, will participate in a one hour speaker training webinar that's going to be facilitated by a professional um, ahead of time before the conference. And they're going to have 75 minutes to present. So it's a slightly longer session to allow time for that audience participation piece. Um, and then we're, we're going to ask those who are selected to sort of give us the PowerPoint ahead of time so we can kind of uh, look at all those, engage, um, and, and uh, provide any comments or suggestions as we move into the uh, move toward the conference for the year. So, we're also piloting a new style of program in which we're going to be uh, threading uh, learning outcomes for two to three consecutive presentations. And so, and the idea with those is that there's sort of a cohort audience that attend that remains constant. So they would attend those two to three programs, uh, consecutive programs in a row, that are around a particular topic. And the idea is really to create time and space for uh, the individuals attending to explore the breadth and depth of a particular of particular topics. So uh, individuals who are selected for that pilot would be we really be encouraging you to work together uh, before the conference to sort of coordinate the presentations and sort of link between them um, and to help make that a meaningful experience for the participants. Um, and then pre-conferences. So this year we're specifically looking for pre-conference uh, proposals in the topic areas uh, that are listed on these sli uh, this slide. So freedom of speech, mental health and resiliency, and small college issues or concerns. Uh, the pre-conference sessions, the three-hour sessions, they're designed to provide space to significantly dive uh, into a topic area. Uh, they're typically formatted um, to provide space where information can be formally shared and learned through participation activity. As you would imagine, sitting through a three-hour, if you're in a three-hour session, you definitely want to have some variety in there in terms of what's going on in the space uh, to help 
uh, to help the audience learn. Um, and the pre-conferences this year are going to be scheduled for Saturday, June 27, uh, either in the morning or the afternoon. All right, so I'm just going to share a couple of tips and tricks. Again, these are um, listed. I think actually more of these are quite a bit more information about this is listed on the website as well. Um, but these are just a, a couple quick tips and most of these we've, we've um, touched on and talked about as well. Um, but making your presentation unique um, is always a plus. Um, unique and relatable, I think, is, is, is a good thing. And um, showing how you're going to include active participation. As we mentioned, um, the outline is a great place to show how you're going to do that. Understanding that not every type of program will have or needs to have active participation, but we do like to see it. Um, and, you know, Melissa just talked about um, some of the new sort of active learning or participatory type sessions that, that we're working on, on doing this year too. So, um, so those are great places to, you know, if you're really interested in, in getting some professional training, some professional speaker training, a little professional development that we're gonna provide for you and you're interested in leading one of those sessions, um, then definitely go ahead and check that box on the form and, and we'll be happy to talk to you about that. Um, including a well-developed outline as, as we um, talked to, Melissa and I both talked um, quite a bit about, is just so, so important. Um, and then providing multiple perspectives from different, different campuses. Again, not always, you know, a must to make it a good program, um, but it, we do like to see it. And then, you know, I think there's always such a thing as maybe have, you know, having too many um, perspectives and such that it dilutes um, um, the content, you know, keeping in mind that you do have only 50 minutes, but, but multiple pr perspectives are good things. Um, and providing data and outcomes um, to support your program um, is something that people like as well. Um, and obviously um, your topic being timely and um, showing best practices are always always a plus and things that people really people really like and the, some things we look for. Um, so I believe I see a question here um, about oh. when will potential volunteers for the program committee be contacted or recruited. So um, we do, at the conference, we do have our program committee meeting, which all are invited to attend, and we should have collected a list of interested individuals there. Uh, certainly individuals who have reviewed or been involved in the past, you know, we send the information to them. But I am also going to include here in this uh, webinar chat a link. Um, and this is a link to a form that you can fill out if you're interested in working with the uh, program committee. Uh, there's some interest areas uh, for different uh, ways you can be involved with the group on there uh, if you're interested in reviewing. But then we also have some additional opportunities in terms of working with some of the other things the committee does in terms of case study. Uh, we run that at the conference, um, the new attendee welcome, and some other areas. So uh, feel free to take a look at that and fill it out if you're interested. If you are interested in reviewing uh, that process this year, the, the majority of the review process takes place uh, in December. Uh, it's a pretty tight turnaround of about 10 or 11 days where uh, you would be reviewing the pro uh, proposals. Uh, but it just indicate your interest on that form and we will be in touch. Excellent. I'm really glad somebody asked that question. Very timely. Mm -hmm. And um, look at folks just another a minute or two to maybe um, ask some questions. But while folks are thinking of questions, if they have any, um, I'm going to go ahead and include my, actually, since you did that, I'm going to include my email um, in the chat box. Spell, spell my name right. Um, so that if you do have any questions, you know, please, I sent it to all panelists. That's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to do that again. Oh, I think panelists, I, all panelists and attendees is what I wanted to do. I did that as well. <laughs> there we go. All panelists and attendees. <laughs> We're sort of new at this Zoom thing. This is only the, we haven't been using Zoom very long for webinars. We've been doing it on GoToWebinar, so it still is a couple things that are new to me. Okay, I think we got it. <laughs> um, yes, but please feel free to contact um, either of us with any kinds of questions that you may have. And I, and I really hope that you will um, go to the, and I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up again one more time um, before we conclude. I really hope that you will um, consider um, the website that I had up. Here it is. Um, that you will consider um, looking at this um, call for programs 
um, page before you submit your program and really tried to, you know, just like with any kind of application you fill out, you know, really tried to read all of the information ahead of time. And I really strongly suggest downloading this assistance guide. It's a PDF. Um, you know, if it were me, I'm old school. I would download it, print it out, read it, make notes on it, and, you know, create myself a Word document, gather all of my information, and then when I'm ready to submit, I just go online, paste it, and save it, and, you know, submit, submit the program. I really think that's the way to go with that. Technology being what it is, I just don't trust it, but, um, okay. Well, um, I don't see any other questions um, Melissa, so did you have any parting comments you want to make before we conclude for today? Uh, no, I just really encourage all of you to um, you know, consider submitting a proposal and uh, whether you do that or not, I hope to see you at the conference in Portland. Sounds great. Thanks, um, thanks Melissa, for, for um, sharing your um, knowledge and expertise with us today. And I thank all of um, our listening audience who took the time to, to spend with us today. I know we went through it kind of quickly, but um, we will be sending out the recording to everyone. Um, it'll be a YouTube link. And so you can always go back and, and refer to it. And as you can see, we have plenty of resources um, here for you as well. So um, good luck everyone who's gonna submit a proposal. I can't wait to see them and I hope to see all of you in Portland. So um, hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Thank you.